I wanted to introduce, if I could, our local hero, Armando Nieto from Community Food and Justice, who does everything. So please give him a warm round of applause. You guys don't know what he does, but he does everything. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Day family, huh? Yeah, I'm Armando Nieto. Um, I want to talk about corporate power. Um, follow up on the themes that everyone's been saying. What we need to be doing now is every morning when you wake up, you know, how can you stick it to the man? Every day, every day. Um, I want to share where I've been for the past week since Sunday. I just got back um, in Detroit, Michigan. Ground zero for the final push, the last corporate takeover of America. Thursday night, East Coast time, the Koch brothers put in a $1 billion bid for the city of Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so you may know Detroit went through bankruptcy. Um, I spent a lot of time there. I was at a food conference, a national food conference, and we were overjoyed to hear Tuesday night in Jackson and Josephine counties in Oregon when they banned GMOs. But at the same time, and there were about 700 of us there, um, we were listening to the brothers and sisters who live in Detroit, um, who were participating in the conference and the culture so rich, uh, you know, young hip hop artists and um, MCs that were, that were leading the conference. Uh, but hearing the stories of uh, the latest fight, the people that were getting out of jail because they were protesting the corporations cutting off water to 250,000 residents. Part of the Koch brothers' bid was to overbid state government led by a Republican governor, which was put up a measure to spend $800 million to get Detroit out of bankruptcy. So what does corporate America do, the Koch brothers? They overbid a billion, and the insidiousness and nastiness of it is 500 million of it is in loans with interest. So this means essentially their investment's guaranteed. How stupid do they think we are? Every day Monsanto is an excellent target for us to stay in contact with. I loved Eric um, talking about you know Dow, Syngenta, all of these companies that have had their way for way too long. But we're in the, we may be at the tipping point of winning this, but we're also at the tipping point that can go a different way. You know, what you can do, what the sister was saying, what you can do is every day when you get up, can you talk to somebody at work? Can you tell them, have they divested their interests in their 401k plans if they're lucky enough to have that? Or what about the boss? What's his company? invested in or her company. We've got to make it transparent that every day with every gesture that we do, and as someone said, if you can shop at Whole Foods and avoid the packaging, great, the labeling. But every day, every single one of us can make a choice and spread the word. You know, like the old movie said that we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. You know, at this conference, um, it was a celebration of Shirley Sherrod, who maybe some of you know, but you know her husband, who was one of the founders of SNCC, right? The coordinating committee, the civil rights, and um, brought the audience to tears when he was singing the songs of the marches back in the civil rights. Remember, those are the civil rights that now the voting rights being taken away again. We're losing it all. As I look out there, and those of you that are part of my generation that went through the hell of the wars that are survivors, we're blessed. I'm really blessed because I get paid to do this for Christ's sakes. But I do it for free as my family's done for generations. What you need to do is talk to one another first. When we leave these gatherings, it's easy to feel alone. It's especially easy because corporate America has that number. They know how to stick it to us, and they're doing it to us every day, in every way, in every medium with which you come in contact. 
So use the tools that you have. Reach out to one another first and foremost. We are brothers and sisters. We are. We. Now, Eric was right into mix the metaphors. You know, we are the spearhead of the change that has to happen because we're not going to roll over and play dead and die of GMO nano nanos taking over our bodies. I wanted to um, introduce our, our beloved Mark Squire, who's a, a grocer, a food justice leader, as well as a board member at the Non-GMO Project. Mark? Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Round of applause. There we go. Well, it's great to be out on the street speaking up. Huh? Uh, it's, to me, it's just thrilling and uh, uh, always exciting. And I, you know, I've been working with Pam a little bit on uh, 1381, and I just want to, you know, actually stress how important it is. Like right now is the time when just these next couple of weeks is going to make a huge difference, and we could do it. We really could do it at this point. So uh, get out, talk to your senators. It's really important. You know, I always want to uh, speak a little bit to the lies that are being told because, you know, you go to Sacramento and you, you follow behind these lobbyists and you hear these lies that are just outrageous. And I think it's really important that we continue to counter them. And, uh, you, know, you know, for instance, you hear over and over these, uh, uh, that the science is somehow on the side of GMOs and that we're anti-science. And they, they actually are going around saying that there are 600 studies that are out there that are supporting the, the need for GMOs. And it's total crock. You know, you go, if you go look at those 600 studies, what you find out is that most of them actually talk about the problems with GMOs. So they're totally like making it up. And unfortunately, you know, senators have too much to do to actually read the material. But, you know, to me, that's outrageous. And so we need to keep talking about that. You know, I, I think I remember, uh, I think it was Ralph Nader that talked about how we needed to get politicians to put tags on them for corporate sponsorship, sort of like we do race cars, uh, which always struck me as a great idea. And I, I think we need to do exactly the same thing with scientists. We've got scientists, uh, our scientific community has now been paid off. You know, you can't get grants for funding science unless you're going to the likes of Monsanto and Syngenta to get funding. So it's really, really difficult to be a scientist in this day and age and really speak the truth about what's happening. Uh, there are, as you know, many scientists on our side about this. The, the scientific community is definitely split about it, but you wouldn't know it from hearing what the lobbyists are saying at all. You would think that we're all a bunch of uh, uh, idiots that have no idea of science, and I think the science is definitely on our side. Uh, one of the other uh, lies that's perpetuated over and over out there is that somehow GMOs are increasing yields for croplands and you know study after study has shown that that's total BS it's just not true but they repeat it like over and over and over again as though if they can say it enough times it will be true and uh, you know the studies are actually showing the reverse it's the if you compare organic systems to GMO and conventional systems, the organic systems yield just as much as the GMO systems do. In fact, what they're discovering is that in drought years, the organic systems suddenly perform better than the GMOs. So we actually have better yields. Another big lie, which is that somehow we need these crops to feed hungry people or to feed poor people. Or, you know, I, I can tell you that if you, the, the math of how you find out how much food costs is really simple. You take the yield, you know, and if the yield is more in an organic system, and the other side of the, the ledger is that uh, organic systems take less inputs. 
So that means that there's less cost to grow organic food. So if the yields are higher and the costs are lower, you get cheaper food. It's that simple. So there is a basic lie out there, and they keep saying it over and over again, that somehow we that are want to eat non-GMOs are the privileged. Other people can't afford that. That's another bunch of BS. It's just not true. We can feed more people for less money with organic agriculture than we can with GMOs, pure and simple. So we need to We need to keep talking about it though because these lies are getting, you know, they're so good at repeating it over and over again that, you know, good people are buying those lies. So I just encourage you all to, you know, keep talking about it. Um, you know, another um, another one that's a little bit more difficult that they keep talking about is that somehow the, the GMOs are going to solve these mysterious pest problems. Like right now there's a big problem with a, 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 a citrus blight that's hurting citrus crops. You know, probably, probably the one and uh, uh, very few successes that the GM, GMO industry has had with uh, helping a, a farm segment counter a uh, virus is with the papayas. But, you know, if you think about it, they've been trying for, you know, 20 years to come up with these new varieties that were going to help with viruses and, and stuff. And they've come up with one to date, one. And that one is even uh, getting aged because the, the, the virus is adapting and then it's it's no good like agriculture does it adapts uh, insects and viruses adapt so um, the um, the reality that they're not telling you that I think is very important to understand is that we have a, a long long history of in using conventional crop breeding to counter pests to counter uh, viruses Many, many, many vi uh, plant viruses have been uh, stopped by doing uh, conventional breeding. And the real crime that's happened in this country in my lifetime is that all of the plant breeding that used to happen by our university systems have been uh, basically taken over. You know, the, it, in this day and age, unless you are getting Monsanto money or big corporate money, for funding uh, uh, plant breeding, you just can't get it. So they, in effect, have changed the whole system so that our plant breeding is no longer owned, just like they've taken the seeds so that they don't any longer belong to us. They've taken our plant breeding away from us. And, and so when they say that they're going to solve problems through uh, breeding plants to be immune to different things, that also is total bunk. We, we were doing that long before they came along. We don't need them to do that. <laughs> to me, one of the, the real crimes that has happened to us as a people around food issues uh, is that we've also been sort of fed this myth that organic foods are an elitist, elitist Thing and you have to be rich and privileged to eat organic food. And I, I also just, you know, I think that's total bunk. It's not true. We need to counter that. Um, the, you know, I think organic agriculture is a very different kind of agriculture than organic agriculture is based. To me, it's as different as uh, us eating good nutritional food and people eating junk food and. Uh, the you know if I think everybody is is learning that if you if you eat refined sugars all the time refined flours you're going to get sick it's like almost every mother knows that right now and yet if you look at our uh, agricultural system you have exactly that same model in agriculture they're basically feeding uh, crops uh, farm chemicals there's something called NPK mentality which is nitrogen phosphorus potassium. They're basically feeding these concentrated uh, foods to plants and ignoring the nutrition, the real nutritional need for plants. So uh, by doing that, they're actually creating a, a system that is just as dysfunctional as if we were eating diff, uh, uh, fast food, junk food all the time. And the, the results are just as uh, dangerous to us. The, when, when you feed crops that way on agricultural land, you get pests, you get uh, uh, blights, you get insects, you, you get all that. So there, there is a solution in front of us and 
um, the research is rapidly coming in that organic agriculture is very much a solution. And for them to, to try and deny us of that as a, as a world and a nation, it's just to me that's the biggest crime going on because we're showing we can do that. And, So thank you. I, I think that's all I really want to say. Again, if I can plug uh, uh, 1381, now's the time. Please get out there and talk about it in a big way. It's really important. Mark has done so much. He is so modest he will never say, but it's people like you, all of you, and Mark Squire that are making this change happen, so I can't thank you enough. I want to introduce um, a local environmental attorney who's got her hands in lots and lots of pots, all of them important, um, Mona Lisa Wallace. Please give her a round of applause. Wow. Wow, look how many of us there are out here. What are we doing here? What are millions of people in 400 plus cities in 52 plus countries doing today at the March Against Monsanto? What are we doing? Why are we here? No We're, it's not just about one brand. Because we all know what mergers and acquisitions are. It's not just about one brand. It's about the corporate industrialization of our food supply. It's about a massive, tremendous experiment. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans have evolved eating whole food. Very recently, we have completely switched over so that the majority of our caloric intake is coming out of factories. That is an experiment. Now we talk about good brands, bad ba brands, good corporations, bad corporations, good science, bad science. But the enormity of this grand experiment is not yet known. We're starting to see some things. We're seeing that children, that, that a fetus gestating during a period of time when atrazine is highest in our environment ha or tend to have genital defects. Atrazine? Atrazine, that chemical, now we hear Monsanto selling themselves as a food company, but they've been around 100 years as a chemical company. A chemical company. Now the chemical atrazine is found in human breast milk. Uh, Tyrone Hayes, who's been mentioned before, has done quite a few studies that have shown that, that amphibians that are exposed to atrazine um, are gender bending males, and it tends to be the feminization of males, the BPA issues, the plastics in our food. These are all integrated, and this is happening now. We have epidemic of autism that no one can explain. We have an epidemic of diabetes. We have type 2 diabetes in, in children now. That is an epidemic. Early onset puberty, little girls having their, their menses at younger and younger ages, and no one knows why. It couldn't be atrazine, it couldn't be uh, the endocrine mimicking substances that are in our water, in our food supply. Why is it that the FDA has told us now, they finally agreed that no amount of trans fat should be eaten by humans? In Amsterdam, it's a crime to feed someone trans fat, but why is it in all our school lunches? This is more than just a what's good for me to eat issue. This is totally integrated into our entire society. And it's also very much a class issue. Now, it's, we live on planet Earth, and planet Earth is like an island. And it's hard to imagine that an island, even a city is like an island, a community, a neighborhood. But if you imagine, just for example, the islands of Hawaii. The islands of Hawaii, 90% of their food is imported. The beautiful, fecund garden that is Hawaii that could feed everyone in Hawaii, people will starve if one week goes by and they don't get shipments of food. And how does that food arrive? It arrives in cans. Are those cans made out of raw material mined somewhere, brought over in, in, in boats, polluting, polluting the, 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 the ocean as it even arrives? And then what do you do with it? And what about feeding that can of squash to your child that's lined with BPA, what's leaking in there? Where did that squash come from? When you can't grow a squash in your backyard? And how many of us know how to cook a squash? So we got complicated things. We got several things going on at one time. At one very important part, it's we need to learn how to eat food. We need to cook food, grow food. We have the ability. We don't need lawns. We need gardens. We can start in our own community. Anywhere where there is 
a median where your tax dollars are paying for that median and they're paying for that lawn on that median and the, and the uh, irrigation that median and the, the city worker to come and mow the lawn over there, that should be growing squash. If you got laid off today, pick a squash on your way home, cook it up for dinner. You don't need to go to the, the food bank and get something out of a can. Now I'm I'm here to say I do I did work hard on Prop 37 and I'm continuing Rachel to work on 1381. But I don't have a lot of faith in the legislative system and I don't think that our representatives in government are representing us. The fact that 37 lost by a slim margin against 46 million dollars of advertising shows that millions of Californians want to know what is in our food. And the fact that we can't ha know what is in our food is a failure of government. Yep. What we need is not just chasing state and local and county laws, because those can also be challenged in court because there's such a thing called interstate commerce. Yep. So localities can try to pass laws and spend, and we, like, we're like busy hamsters in the wheel, just getting fatigued until they just push, push us off. What we need is a federal, federal law. Yeah. We need to make the FDA responsible It's called the precautionary rule. It's what Europe has, because we don't know good science or bad science, but we have enough science about GMO and about atrazine to know that we don't know. That's why GMO is banned in Europe. That's why atrazine has been banned since 2004. We know enough to know that we don't know. And until we have a federal precautionary rule, a federal precautionary law, we are going to continue to chase local state laws where they will be challenged in court with their millions and millions of dollars. Now, what we've already done here in the streets and in our laws and in our propositions, win or lose, is to show that millions and millions of people want to know what's in our food. And it seems like a very simple thing to me, that if you're going to cross a tomato and a fish, you have to prove that it's food before you feed that to someone's child. And before you feed something to your child, you should be able to know what's in it. So I encourage us all to do all three things. Cook, cook locally, eat locally, grow our own food locally. That's one thing. The other thing is to continue to support this movement in the legislation. But the other thing, the third thing that we really need to do is we need to think of bigger picture and keep our eye on the prize. Because March Against Monsanto is not about one brand. It is not about just GMO. It's about the precautionary rule and that we have a right to know what's in our food. I wanted to introduce um, our, our expert from Geo Engineering Watch who helped us out over there at Climate Change. Thank you for sticking out. That was, that was an exciting day. This is again Dane Wigington. I hope I got it right. Did I, Dane? Thank you. <laughs> Come on up. My thanks to everybody who, who took the time to come here today. I don't know how many of you know about climate engineering. You'll hear about it soon enough. This is going on in our skies. We have a few people that do. Monsanto's intertwined with this as well. It's called geoengineering and the semantics matter. If you use the science terms, people will look at hard science. The, the bottom line is this. If we can't walk out our door without breathing in heavy metals, we have a problem of the first order. People who don't think this is going on have simply not done their research, period. We've done 100 lab tests in Northern California alone. The amount of aluminum and barium, strontium, toxic heavy metals coming down in our rain is absolutely lethal. State of California now has just acknowledged that aluminum is running down the waterways, but they've made it clear they're not about to test the rain. You can't find something if you're not looking for it. So at this point, We've seen aquatic insect life decline, for example, in Northern California, 90% in 10 years as measured by U.S. Forest Service biologists. We're seeing species extinction rate today globally, 200 species of plant and animal going extinct today. Granted, there's a lot of causes for that, but the bottom line is, mathematically speaking, there's no greater cause of overall contamination on the planet with heavy metals than climate engineering. Our goal at geoengineeringwatch.org is to get people to simply investigate this issue, do research, don't operate off preconception. Governmental agencies are doing everything they can to stonewall this issue because how many people do you know that are going to be satisfied when they find out these programs are going on and we're all breathing aluminum, barium, and strontium connected to 
Alzheimer's, dementia, autism. How many people you know are going to be happy when they know they're breathing this? And there's absolutely no question about this material being dispersed in our airways. At geoengineeringwatch.org, we have film footage of these tankers dispersing at altitude. And if we would argue it's shredding, it's, we know it's shredding the ozone layer. How many of you feel the sun extremely warm on your yes. face lately? Yes. A lot. It's burning the bark off of trees. It's, it's, it's killing plankton in the oceans. The bottom line is we feel mathematically, statistically, there's no greater overall assault on the planet today than geoengineering. Nuclear is very serious, obviously, and geoengineering would be the greatest and most immediate threat short of nuclear catastrophe. But the bottom line is there's nowhere you can run, nowhere you can hide from this issue. A thousand whales just tested in 2010 from the most remote places on the planet. They had, quote, jaw-dropping levels of aluminum in their tissues. I guarantee it's in every single one of you. Bottom line is we're simply trying to bring this to light. If, if, we, do, if we don't have a planet that will support life and if these programs continue to shred the ozone layer, disrupt the hydrological cycle, contaminate our soils, we won't grow anything. Not even a Monsanto genetically modified aluminum resistant seed will, will grow if we keep on this track. So I, I appreciate everybody's time in investigating this issue. If anybody wants a DVD or information on this issue, I, if you will put it to use, I'll give it to you. I have DVDs right back there next to the, to the geoengineering sign. If anybody will put it to good use, I will give it to you. Who are you? G, my name is Dane Wiggins, and I'm with the website geoengineeringwatch.org. I have a background with Bechtel Power Company in the renewable energy. That's how I got into this issue. My, my home was on the cover of the world's largest renewable energy magazine. When I started to lose 60, 70, 80 percent of my solar uptake from strictly what these aircraft were emitting, that's an astounding amount of sun to block. Global dimming today, a figure most people have never heard of, it's 25 percent. 25 percent of the sun's direct rays are no longer reaching, reaching the surface of the planet. Yes, pollution is a part of that. Geoengineering is a much, much bigger part of that. That is the express goal of climate engineering to block the sun at the expense of derailing the planet's life support system. So if you want to learn about this and you want a DVD and you'll put it to good use, come back there. I'll give it to you. It's on me. I simply, we're simply trying to get the word out before there's nothing left of the Earth's life support systems. All of us matter. Any one of us in this crowd could be the pebble that knocks the landslide of awareness loose and brings this issue to light. Every one of you matter. All of us need to pull together.